Welcome, folks, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. Today we have Chicago Tribune photographer and photojournalist Scott Struzante. Scott, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Um, you know, when I saw your post um, on Kickstarter and I said, wow, you know, this is something different, and I saw the video of how you'd gone back uh, to this area uh, and photographed it for 14 years. And you'd come back and you'd put it together as a project. Uh, I was just blown away. I want to know, what inspired you first to even do this project? Um, back in 1994, when I started, I was working at a, a newspaper called The Daily South Town. And it was a meat and, meat and potatoes newspaper. I did a lot of sports, a lot of news. And I, I didn't go to school for photography, so I didn't have any idea what a photo story was. I didn't really know about intimate storytelling. Um, so right around that time, I started looking at the work of other photographers and, and saying, hey, I, I would love to work on a photo story, but, you know, I don't, I don't know what to shoot. I don't have any ideas. And so one day I um, was assigned to photograph a Gene and Harlow Cagwin at their farm for a story. And after I photographed them for a couple hours, um, I really started to, you know, enjoy their company. And, I, and being a city kid, I love being on the farm. So as I was leaving, I asked if I could come back and photograph them again at some point. And they, they were fine with that. And so it kind of became a place that when I was kind of disgruntled with my job or I wasn't feeling excited about my assignments, I would head out to the farm and just hang out with Gene and Harlow and make photographs of calves being born. And it was just kind of almost for me just some kind of thing to stay sane. And I never, ever, ever thought at that point that it would be anything more than me just going to the farm. And then as time went on, it just kind of built and built and built. And, you know, there was no forethought to it, but it just kind of was this gentle ball rolling down a hill and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of gathered steam as it went on over the years. Definitely. Uh, this is a personal project. We, you know, we, we do know that you work for the Chicago Tribune as a staff photographer. Uh, but as personal projects go, you've taken your personal time to do this one project for 14 years. Is this, is this common ground Kickstarter, Kickstarter book project uh, sort of the culmination of that 14 years? Are you looking to close it out with this book yeah, project? Yeah, definitely. You know, I know it's something I'll always photograph. I'll keep doing it. But I think at this point it's a complete thought. You know, starting with Gene and Harlow on the farm and then moving into the Grabenhofer family in the Willow Walk subdivision that, that, that kind of sprung up from the farmland. Um, you know, it's something where I think at this point um, the project is ready to be published. And I, I want that permanence, you know, to have in book form. You know, I really love Media Storm's piece that they did in 2008. I thought that was beautiful. Chad Stevens and Brian Storm you know, combined to make this just beautiful piece that, that I'm, I'm just so proud to have my name attached to. And, you know, but I think at this point, you know, it's ready to be a book. And I've been wanting to have it be a book for a while. I kept putting it off and putting it off. But then um, last August, a Harlow, the farmer, died. And, you know, I kind of was kicking myself. You know, I was like, oh, I wish Harlow could have seen the book, you know. And so I have a little bit of regret that I didn't kind of get on this earlier. And, and, and so Harlow could have seen it. But, you know, Jean, his widow, is... Um, is is really excited about it and and so I, you know I definitely want to um, you know dedicate this book to Harlow and so that's another real important reason that, that I want to get this in print. Uh, beyond the obvious uh, I, I know I get it when I see the pictures side by side and um, you know you've worked with uh, Mike Davis and Deadpan Davis to put this book together. Um, what exactly are you looking for people to get out of the book? What is it that they that you feel like okay, by by presenting images side by side, you're saying what exactly? Well, well, if if you live in an urban area, I think you've kind of seen um, the suburban and kind of outlying farmland being gobbled up, you know, subdivisions, you know, mostly in the '90s and early 2000s. Um, but you know, for me, it's not kind of a project with an agenda. You know, for me, it's just a historical look at this plot of land. And, and, you know, I really have come over the years to kind of want to look closer and closer and closer at people's lives. And, and not like people who, you know, and these are valid stories, but I'm not looking for people who are paralyzed or, or you know, someone at war. You know, I want to photograph everyday life. 
and, and you know, having this the access to two families' everyday lives for not only, you know, a day or a week, but for years has been so amazing. And, and I just love the little moments, you know, both on the farm and in suburbia. So, you know, a lot of people will look at the project and go, oh, this is a horrible thing. You know, our farmland's being gobbled up and, you know, sub suburbs suck, you know, but it's not that at all. You know, for me, I live in the suburbs. You know, I, I, I own a home that, that is built on a f former farm. You know, so this is my everyday life. And, you know, so for me, it's, it's just kind of a historical, you know, glance of kind of America at this point in history. And, you know, I, I love the suburbs. I love the farm, you know, and, and I'm not trying to take a shot at people. But also, I think for me, the project is also kind of a, a starting point for other people to kind of have their own thoughts, you know, so I'm not trying to push someone in one direction. You know, if people are pro-farm or pro-suburbs or whatever, you know, I'm totally, you know, open for that. You know, one of, one of the, the great things for me is when people write to me and, and um, David Gutenfelder, who is like probably my all-time favorite photographer working right now, um, sent me a letter back in 2008 and he, he grew up on a farm in Iowa and he expressed this story to me when his, his family farm was um, knocked down. They dug a hole behind it and they just bulldozed the house into the hole and they buried it. And I just thought that that imagery was just so amazing. And, um, and so, you know, that touched me so much that I've actually asked David to write the foreword for the book and he's agreed to. So I'm really happy that someone who has the experience of, of seeing this is gonna, you know, be part of the project. But, you know, just, you know, living where I do out in the suburbs of Chicago, you know, every day, you know, I see, you know, either a new subdivision being built or one that started being built and now is just kind of sitting there unused. So, you know, for me, I, I do have definitely feelings um, of, of kind of the issue, but for me, it's all about the people. And it's more a universal thing where we can see ourselves in, in, in other people. And so I think I like just the universality of the project and how, you know, you can kind of relate, you know, to either the farm couple or the suburban family or maybe even both. Uh, what I enjoyed from the, the quick view of the, the book or the images side by side as it was presented um, on your Kickstarter page is how symmetrical almost some of the moments are. I don't know if that's the, the right word for it, but, you know, I just feel, felt like, wow, you found images that sort of echoed, you know, one situation with another. And... I'm just curious. I mean, how how did you do that? I mean, are you looking for those things uh, consciously, or is it sort of like, okay, we just went out today into the farm and I photographed it, and oh, here we go, we got pictures from the farm, and hello, look, that looks just like that other picture I shot 20 years ago, or well, not 20, but 10 right. years ago. You know, right. uh, how did that? How does that? How does that process work for you? Well, when I first, you know, I ended shooting on the farm in 2002, and then. I met Amanda, Amanda, the mother in the suburban family, while talking to a photo class. And so she invited me out in 2007 to photograph her family. And the second time I was out there, I photographed her son, Ben, rolling around in the front yard um, with a jump rope with his friend. And, you know, that reminded me of a photo I took of Harlow, you know, rolling around with a calf out in a field. And so I had, up to that point, I really had no idea, you know, how I was going to connect the farm and the subdivision. You know, I just kind of, my, my theory is always that just go out and start shooting. That's the first thing you do. You know, if you sit around and think and, and you'll just think and never get anything done. So I just started shooting. And that second visit, I, I made that connection uh, of, of telling the story, comparing photos and diptychs. And so then I went back actually that day and kind of went through a lot of my farm negatives and, and the photos I had taken at the, the suburbs. And I, I made, I think, three or four other diptychs. And, and then, you know, as I would go out for, um, you know, future visits, you know, I would just photograph what happened. And, and it always, something would always rise up that would kind of, you know, jar my memory a little bit and say, oh, this, this seems familiar. And, and, and I was so lucky to find the Gravenhofer family because, you know, the three triplets that Amanda has, you know, the two girls, Caitlin and Abby, they, they just have these kind of, old soul feel to them, you know? And when they're, I remember one photo, they were out planting a butterfly garden and Caitlin was holding a pitchfork, 
you know, and she just had this look on her face. And, you know, I have all these photos of Harlow with a pitchfork, you know, right? And it was just so, so perfect. And, you know, and just, it was just almost too easy. It was like every time I'd be out there, something would happen. And there were cases too, where I would make a photo, you know, in the subdivision that I really liked, or there was one of my favorite farm photos. So I would kind of search out through my archives, trying to find a match. And some of those didn't quite work as well, but, but I, I do like those. But, you know, it's definitely a situation where there were only two situations where I kind of pre-planned a diptych. Um, one was the aerial, which is going to be on the cover. So I had the aerial from the farm, and then I did an aerial of the subdivision. And then there was one photo I had taken from the second floor of the Cagwin home, and I went up and shot out of the second floor of the um, Gravenhofer home. And that one, because it's really dark, it almost looks like one photo. Right, it's, right. You know, and, and so that one... It was always kind of like a little mind bender, you know, where it looks like it's one image, and you, but it's kind of a glimpse into two different eras. And, and, and the funny thing is when I was like kind of at the height of this project, I would go to the grocery store or I would go someplace else, and I'd see these moments that matched farm photos, even though it wasn't even at the subdivision, you know, and it was just like, so everything to me was like matching. And, and, and so, you know, it actually, you know, once I had the original idea, it was actually pretty simple. And now, even now, you know, I was out a couple months ago photographing at the subdivision, and I think I made five more diptychs. So it's, it's almost unlimited. I could probably keep going until I ran out of farm photos, basically. Gotcha. Um, tell us a little bit about working with Mike Davis and Deb Pang Davis. What was that like, and how did they challenge you in, in terms of putting this book project together? Yeah, well, you know, Mike, Mike is is a brilliant photo mind. And he um, edited my portfolio back in 2001 that won National Newspaper Photographer of the Year. And, and even back then, the, photo, the, the combinations he put together, the images that he, that he chose were ones I, I wouldn't have put in a portfolio. And now looking back, it's like, oh yeah, duh, that's perfect. You know? And so he, he operates on a different level, I think, than most people. And he's, he's kind of, you know, thinking of things that, that the normal photographer doesn't. And, and when he started editing this, he mentioned to me that it's, it was kind of like, you know, editing with a Rubik's cube, you know, because he wanted, you know, to like have this work on multiple levels where all the farm photos were, were a certain story, where all the suburban photos were a certain story, where the diptychs were telling a certain story. So I, I probably really don't even understand parts of the edit. Maybe someday I'll wake up and go, oh, I see what Mike is thinking because he operates so above me. Sure. And, um, and then Deb, Deb is just, you know, she worked at Copley. Copley were the newspapers, you know, outside of Chicago back in the two, you know, early 2000s that produced um, Todd Heisler and John Lowenstein and Rob Finch and Brian Planka. And it was just an amazing, amazing time. And, you know, so Deb was working at those papers, too. So she knows, you know, kind of our aesthetic of storytelling. And, and plus, she's such a dynamic go-getter and, and, you know, just really, really smart and, and great flair for design. And so I'm, I'm really excited to be working with them. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, once we went our separate ways and Deb and Mike are now at Syracuse, um, you know, it, it's really exciting to kind of be able to, to, to rub elbows with them and, I'll be at Look 3 this weekend with them, so I, oh, I have lovely. plenty of time uh, to, to sit around and, and, and reminisce. That's great. Um, one last question for you, Scott. Um, the project is being uh, funded through a, a Kickstarter pro, uh, campaign, um, and you're right now, I'm looking at your screen, It's uh, you're at uh, $15,075, and you're looking for $42,500 to make right. this all happen. Um, and you have, you have almost... 250 backers, uh, and you've got 22 days to go. So <laughs> <laughs> all the stats are lovely. Uh, and certainly reaching out to bloggers like myself uh, probably help uh, in getting the word out. What else are you doing uh, to get the word out? Yeah, well, at this point, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, going through like every single one of my Facebook friends and, you know, kind of, you know, I'm getting kind of tired of begging, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's really humbling and, um, but, but it's really important to me. And, and so I have a couple um, speaking events coming up in the Chicago area. And, you know, when I'm at Look 3 this weekend, I'm going to be bringing a big pile of postcards and hopefully uh, getting people while they're drunk and, and getting their support. And, uh, but, but it's just, you know, I'm, I'm pretty naive in this world. And, you know, I have come to realize that, you know, no one is going to pay 
to have your photo book published anymore. You know, it's not like you can go into a major publisher and they're going to say, yeah, I'm going to publish this book. It just doesn't happen anymore. Right. So you kind of have to, you know, find more creative ways. So I'm just hoping that the photojournalism community and, and trying to get outside the photojournalism community, I think, is going to be the key. Is because I, I think, you know, there's just a limited amount of money that, that we can continue to support each other as photographers. So I'm trying to find creative ways to, you know, get out into, you know, my area out here and get them aware of the project. And, and so that's something that I'm hoping I can do is find some outlets and some people, you know, who love photography, but also are more kind of, you know, issue oriented people to, to back the project. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. I'm keeping my fingers crossed and, uh, you know, maybe the day before this, uh, ends, I'll have to give my mom a call and say, Hey mom, yeah. <laughs> you know, that college fun for my daughter that's uh, cracking to that <laughs> um, um i, I kind of lied to you I, I do have a question for you and and you being in chicago uh you've probably been asked as a number of times you've been the chicago photojournalists have been in the news uh the national news now in the last week and a half uh for uh some rather you know uh not but well, direct reasons are you know the chicago sun times just canned our whole photojournalism department uh, it's, a, it's a scary time for photojournalists uh, now. Uh, it's been scary since I started in the business, and I, I, I quit and left off and did something else, but most people don't have that luxury when they've committed to themselves to a life of doing what you do, which is right. document a story of, of an area for 14 years. I mean, you've given phys your physical self, your emotional self to being and doing this uh, and telling the story visually. Um, there's a question there somewhere. I want to know what do you what do you think is happening in the photojournalism world? Yeah, it's just it's heartbreaking. You know, it's just you know, and it's been kind of chipping away and chipping away and chipping away. You know, you lose five people here and ten people there. You know, and and just this whole kind of you know kicking aside an entire photo staff. You know, it's not only you know an economic thing, but they had to know they were making some larger point, and I'm not sure what that point is. Um, you know, it, it's 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 just you know throwing away like john white said throwing away like a generation of photojournalists you know and it's yeah i, I don't know i'm you know i'm still an optimistic person and, and and this is i think the golden age of photography um it's like you've never been able to more people are photographing it's so easy to you know send out your photos you know i can walk down michigan avenue and do a street photo on my iphone and put it on instagram and facebook and twitter within you know seconds and you know it, it I, I, never, I have never seen so many photographers in the world that are so amazing, doing great work that I've never heard of. It's just, it's awe-inspiring. But, you know, the problem is, is that there's no model to fund all this work. You know, people are now so used to getting everything for free on the internet that it's just like, well, why would I pay for a paywall and just go someplace else? Or, you know, it, it's just, it, it just, I don't know. I, I'm hoping that somehow they can they, I don't know who they are, you know, <laughs> some young photographer coming up can kind of figure this out and create some system to, uh, you know, you know, kind of save the industry. But it's, you know, Brian Storm once said, you know, photojournalism will never die because people will continue to do it for free. And that is so true and so sad. And, but it's like, I'm never going to stop. This is my passion. This is my life. This is my obsession, you know, and, um, I guess we're just gonna have to try to find creative ways to get our work out there or we'll have to just kind of, you know, fund our work through doing real work, you know, actually getting a job or, you know, shooting weddings or something. So, but, uh, you know, news gathering is so important and journalism is so important, you know, just as a check and balance for society that, you know, I, my brain can't fathom a, a day when, when that doesn't exist anymore. So, um, you know, I, I'm still optimistic, but I'm, I'm less optimistic than I was two weeks ago. But, you know, there's still great work to be done. There's still great photographers doing it. So, you know, hopefully, you know, it'll all just kind of, you know, thanks to people like you spreading the word, it'll, you know, survive and live and hopefully thrive. Thank you so much, Scott, for your time. Uh, Thank for your, you. For your insight. And, and I want to wish you the very best for Common Ground. I know it'll happen. Um, it's, it's an exciting project um, I know you've put your heart and soul into it and uh, so I am going to will it that it happens so um, <laughs> you know uh, awesome. and I'll do my very best in promoting uh, this video uh, interview with you 
uh, as well as the, the Kickstarter page as well. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Enjoy meeting you. Take care. Bye.